Now, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come in tonight. <coughs> so, I'm a geneticist. Um, I'm interested in, in human genetic variation, so whole, how we all differ at the level of our DNA. Um, and this lecture is looking at evolution. Um, it's something that's obviously been going on for since the dawn of, of organisms on the planet and so on. It's shaped how we look, how we feel, our predisposition to disease today. And uh, I'm going to look at it, at evolution, in the context of populations who live in a very extreme environment. And that environment is the one of high altitude. So just to kind of give you some idea, I think it's very ha hard for any of us to grasp what it must be like to try and perform at, at high altitude. This uh, video, which I picked up from YouTube, I'd like to say, or I wish I could say this was me climbing K2, but uh, this is a, a video of someone at a point on K2 called the bottleneck, which is about 8,300 meters. And I just want you to listen to his breathing. So this person isn't doing anything, they're just taking a video with their camera, they're in the resting state, and yet their rate of ventilation is extremely high. And the reason why they're breathing so heavily is because they're 8,300 meters above sea level. <coughs> and as you go to such heights, the air gets very, very thin. And the reason why it's thin is because there's less atmosphere above you pushing down on it. So at sea level, the air is quite dense and there's a lot of oxygen available for us to breathe. But as you go up in altitude, the air gets thinner and thinner to the point where you go above 8,000 meters, they refer to it as the so-called death zone because our bodies very much struggle to perform at this altitude. So you can see the, the camp they would have left from just there in the background. So, despite his rate of, of breathing being that high, he was actually breathing supplementary oxygen at the same time. So if he had taken his mask off, he would have been in further trouble again. <coughs> so, this diagram here is just illustrating what happens in terms of the, the density of air or the availability of oxygen as you increase in altitude. So at sea level, we have 100% of the relative availability of oxygen or the partial pressure, pressure of oxygen compared to sea level. And as you increase in altitude, so as you go up in altitude, that percentage avail of available oxygen starts to drop, right? So there's still the same percent of oxygen relative to nitrogen in the air, uh, but the air has just become thinner. So the molecules are more spaced apart. So effectively, there's less for us to breathe. So at about 8,000 meters, you have a third of the available oxygen available to you. Uh, but it's important to note that there are around 25 million people around the world today that live at altitudes above 2,500 meters. So at 2,500 meters, you're looking at somewhere around 65 to 70 percent of the available oxygen. So that's a significant drop. And that's why for any of you who perhaps have gone to the Alps on skiing holidays or trekking holidays, you would have perhaps felt that so-called thin air uh, where even a relatively mild degree of exercise can quickly put you out of breath. Now, as you might expect, there can be health complications with these extremes of altitude. So if any of us, say, hopped on a plane, uh, flew into Kathmandu, uh, and then took another short flight, and went into Lukla, and then started to trek towards Everest Base Camp, we would be faced uh, with some health issues. And the first one, um, and perhaps a, a good percentage, maybe 40 or 50 percent of us, might experience what's called acute mountain sickness. So we might feel uh, quite sick in the stomach, we'd have a headache, our rate of respiration would start to increase, we'd have trouble sleeping, right? So generally, we'd feel like crap. And the only way that we can really um, address this issue is to decrease in altitude, so to go back down. Now, if we continue climbing, we leave Everest Brace Camp and we start going up uh, the Kumbu Icefall and so on up towards Mount Everest, uh, and we go at altitudes above four or 5,000 meters, there are two other much more serious complications that we could be faced with. We could have what's called HACE, or High Altitude Cerebral Edema, or HAPE, High Altitude Pulmonary Edema. So as the name suggests, this one is dealing with the brain, and the other one is dealing with your heart and lungs. <coughs> <coughs> 
So with haste, a climber might arrive into camp, he would be disoriented or she might have trouble uh, finding words, they might lack coordination. Uh, and these would be early signs of the onset of haste and the problem is that fluid is starting to accumulate in the brain. And this is a life-threatening condition. Really the only way to address it is to get the climber down in altitude very, very quickly. Or another climber might arrive in, uh, they'd be very short of breath, very shallow breaths, uh, their pulse rate would be elevated and they'd have a, a, quite a bad cough and they might start coughing pink sputum towards the end stages of this condition. And these individuals have a problem with their lungs. Their lungs are starting to fill with fluid, so they're unable to really breathe properly and, and absorb that oxygen that's so critical to their uh, survival at altitude. So acute mountain sickness is relatively mild. It occurs at altitudes above maybe two or 3,000 meters, uh, but still the individual would have to descend. Haste and hape are much more severe, but tend to only occur at altitudes above maybe four or 5,000 meters. These two are life-threatening. Um, now another condition, like let's say if we decided we weren't just going to go to the Himalaya on holidays, we'd go back to Kathmandu and perhaps do a sabbatical or live there for a couple of years. What happens then is we become prone to a condition called chronic mountain sickness. So chronic mountain sickness in a way um, can be explained by the um, behavior of certain athletes who like to train at altitude, right? So you hear about cyclists or long distance runners who like to train high and compete low, right? So the reason they train high is because when they go to altitude, the air gets thinner and their bodies respond by producing more hemoglobin. So hemoglobin are the little red uh, cells that exist in our blood and these are the, uh, the units that carry oxygen. So the more hemoglobin that we have, in theory, the more oxygen that we're able to carry uh, in our blood. So that's why the cyclists training for the Tour de France, they love to go to altitude before the race. Uh, they will hopefully increase their hemoglobin content so when they come down and race, they'll have a higher blood carrying capacity than the person who's been training at sea level. Or sometimes they might go a step further and when they're at altitude, they'll draw some blood off themselves, store it in bags, and then in the middle of the race, right, when their hemoglobin has started to drop down because they've been working so hard for week on week, they'll then do what's called blood doping. So this is what you've heard about in the news where when their hemoglobin has gone low after a very tough week or two, they'll do a transfusion with their own blood that they had taken when they are at altitude so they'll have fresh blood at a higher hematocrit. So that's a way of, uh, it's an illegal behavior to try and boost your hemoglobin content. But just going back to Kathmandu, if we stay resident there for a couple of years, our bodies will respond in very similar ways to the cyclists. We'll produce a lot of hemoglobin, which in the short term is a good thing, right? Because we're struggling with our oxygen carrying capacity. But in the long term, this is dangerous because your blood starts to thicken and as it thickens, it's less able to circulate properly in your pulmonary system. And then when it's not able to circulate properly, it actually struggles to absorb oxygen from your lungs and carry it to more distant parts of your body. So with chronic mountain sickness, uh, uh, a patient uh, might present who's hypoxic, the oxygen levels are very, very low in their body. When you look at the hemoglobin concentration, it's very, very high, so we call that polycythemia. Uh, and they also have cyanosis, where they might have purple patches on the tips of their nose or on their cheek because those extreme parts of their bodies aren't being oxygenated properly because their cardiovascular system or, or pulmonary system is slowing down because the blood is too thick. So too much hemoglobin at altitude over a long period of time is a bad thing. It causes chronic mountain sickness which ultimately causes heart failure. <clears throat> but there are indigenous populations who dwell at a high altitude uh, who seem to be very resistant to these conditions. And one of those populations are the Sherpa people. So you might be familiar with the Sherpa from um, uh, hearing about expeditions to K2 and to Everest and other uh, major peaks in the Himalaya. And perhaps this is the most famous ambassador of the Sherpa. This is Tengzing Norgay, and next to him is Edmund Hillary. So of course, these are the, the pair who were the first to summit Everest. And as far as I'm aware, it was never made clear who actually summited it first, right? Whether it was Hillary uh, or, or Tengzing. I think the official line was they summited together. But I think what no one would dispute is that without the Sherpa, uh, Tengzing and his colleagues, this expedition would never have summited Everest because the Sher Sherpa people are so well adapted to the low oxygen environment that they were able to do uh, a lot of the very hard graft on the mountain in terms of carrying loads up the mountain, fixing ropes and so on. 
And indeed, the very first expeditions to Everest uh, in the 1920s with Irving and Mallory, they had large teams of Sherpa who, who did a lot of that fixing ropes, carrying loads, and so on. And that tradition follows through today. So one of the uh, perhaps most profitable careers for a, a Sherpa individual is to be a, a guide on Everest uh, or other major peaks in, in the Himalaya. So the Sherpa, who are they? Well, they live in Nepal. So of course, Nepal uh, is really located uh, not quite in the middle of the Himalaya, but the highest mountains of the Himalaya are right along the border between Nepal and Tibet. And uh, Everest is somewhere around here to the east, the northeastern part of Nepal. And the Sherpa dwell in a, a particular part of Nepal over here, very close to Everest, but from historical records and from oral records, they're not actually Nepalese. They are thought to have moved from somewhere in the east of Tibet. Right? So from a region that's physically quite distant, probably a couple of hundred kilometers, uh, but geographically it's very distant because there are huge mountain peaks between uh, their perhaps ancestral homeland and their, where they dwell today. So this map is just kind of zoomed in on Nepal, uh, and I've tried to circle here the region around the Khumbu Valley. So the Khumbu Valley is thought to be the first place where the Sherpa arrived when they migrated from Tibet somewhere around 600 to 1,000 years ago. And the regions in brown now show where uh, Sherpa reside today, and the reason why it's extended is because uh, they moved when they traded salt. So salt is a very valuable asset in the Himalaya, and the, the Sherpa traded salt, and as they did, they moved to different regions uh, within Nepal, uh, and so the population has expanded. Now, there are other indigenous high-altitude populations dwelling around the world, so this map here is color-coded to show you regions uh, of different altitudes. So the regions, I'd like you to focus on the regions in red, because these are above, say, around 2,500 meters. And remember I said that 25 million people dwell in these high altitude regions? Well, there are three ones that have been quite heavily studied. Uh, they are the Himalaya, the Andes in South America, and the Ethiopian Plateau in, in Africa. So in the Himalaya, we've already alluded to the Sherpa and Tibetan and Nepalese indigenous populations. Um, in South America, we have the Quechua and the Aymara. So these live around Peru and Bolivia today. Uh, and in Ethiopia, uh, around the Semian Plateau, we have the Amhara and the Oromo. So these are two different ethnic groups in Ethiopia that dwell on the, on the Semian Plateau, and they're kind of broadly speaking divided by the Great, Great Rift Valley. So to the north of the Great Rift, Rift Valley, we have the Amhara, and to the south, we have the Oromo. Now, part of the talk title is history, right? And the history of these populations differ. Well, obviously they differ, and they're in very different parts of the world, but the length of time that they've been dwelling at, at altitude is very different. So remember, modern humans would have evolved in Africa and moved out of Africa in waves over the last 100,000 odd years. And the current day Tibetans and Sherpa people uh, are thought to have descended from a group that first moved into the Himalaya around 30,000 years ago. And you can tell these dates from archeological records. Uh, South America, on the other hand, was uh, first inhabited much more recently. So for people to reach South America, uh, they had to, this is obviously a very shortened version, but they had to move out of Africa, cross through Asia, and then cross the Bering Straits from uh, Siberia towards current day Alaska, and then move down the American continent. So it was a much further journey for, for people to travel. So it took many, many generations. And it's thought that the uh, descendants of the Quechua and the Amhara first entered South America somewhere around 9,000 years ago. So 30,000 years versus 9,000 years. And these are significant differences in terms of evolution because the clock that evolution looks at is the number of generations. Right? So roughly speaking, we say 30 years per generation. So the number of generations in a population uh, is really the, uh, the time element for determining how long evolution has had to really work to shape the genomes of that particular population. So the equation Amhara descend from a group around 9,000 years ago. Genetically, they look actually very similar. They're differentiated by the language that they speak. Uh, and it's uh, thought that the, um, the Inca culture uh, spread the Amhara group uh, to the point where today there are quite a, a number more 
of this, um, sorry, Quasia group uh, than the uh, uh, Amhara. So the Ethiopian groups are, are thought to descend from a group that moved to altitude around 5,000 years ago. So these are relatively young, even though uh, modern humans have been resident in Africa for 100,000 odd years plus. Those on the Semien Plateau specifically from which the current day populations descend from are thought to be there only for the last 5,000 odd years. So they're relatively young. But all these populations have been at altitude for different periods of time. So I've alluded to selection quite a bit and I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of take a step back and think about natural selection in terms of the selective forces at play. So if you think of human populations through time, they've been challenged by many different forces, many different environmental forces. So that could be perhaps how hot or how cold the environment is that the population lives, uh, perhaps the strength of sunlight, so UV rays are obviously going to burn, they can cause skin cancers, so sometimes our skin color might need to adapt and change to, to act as a barrier against very strong uh, UV rays. Uh, if we're living in very northern or polar regions, we might want to have more fat deposits under our skin so that we're better insulated against the cold. And of course, our diet is going to be a major issue as well. Diet of, in, in human populations went through a dramatic change roughly around 10,000 years ago with the development of farming. We went from a hunter-gatherer diet to a more pastoral uh, farming diet. So as that diet changed, so too must the enzymes that help us break down food have changed and evolved to adapt to that new diet. Disease is going to have a major impact on populations. Of course, if there's an infectious disease uh, that could potentially wipe out a, a, a population or really decrease the size of a population, those individuals who are resistant to that disease for genetic reasons, let's say, they are going to survive and the following population will descend from them. So disease can have a major impact on, uh, on natural selection. It's a major selective force. And of course, the air we breathe is going to be a major issue. This is something we perhaps take for granted. Uh, the wonderful clean air that we have here in Ireland uh, is obviously very uh, hospitable to, to humankind, but there are parts of the world, such as the Himalaya, where although, although the uh, air is beautiful and clear, it's very, very thin, and it's going to be quite difficult for us to breathe. So human, humans and other organisms have really been heavily influenced by changes in oxygen concentration uh, through time. So this has been a major selective force. Now, an important thing to consider in terms of natural selection is whether or not a force has been controlled, right? And by that I mean, for example, if you think of diet, we are no longer forced to eat certain foods as perhaps individuals or populations were a couple of hundred years ago where you had to eat what you could gather or what you were growing in your backyard or what perhaps you could trade with with a neighbor. Today it's very different. We can walk down to Aldi or Tesco and buy what we want, okay? So really whether we are suited individually to a food or not is not such a big deal anymore <coughs> because we can just pick another food. Similarly our environment. If we don't like the environment we're living in in terms of uh, temperature, we have the option to move, we can wear more clothes, we can turn the heating on or the air conditioning on and so on. Even with sunlight, now we can, we've developed creams and so on that offer very good protection against these forces. With disease, there's obviously been major steps forward uh, with medicine that's helping us to address many, but of course not all infectious diseases. But that means that these conditions now, the impact that they have on natural selection has begun to slow. But one force that we really have very little, if not no, control over is the concentration uh, or the availability of oxygen in the air that we breathe. The point being that if we go to altitude, either we put on a gas mask, which of course we can only do in the short term, or we have to try and perform and go about our daily lives with that environment in hand. And it's for that reason um, that low oxygen at high altitude is still probably or is possibly the strongest selective force uh, that's uh, still ongoing in human populations today. So physiologists in the, in the 60s and indeed before uh, had recognized the pressure that low oxygen must put on populations and they began studying these indigenous groups to see if they had adapted in some sort of a physiological manner to those changes. They weren't able to sequence the DNA of individuals in the 60s, but what they could do is measure certain parameters to see if people who uh, are indigenous of high altitude regions 
had somehow adapted in ways that they could measure physiologically. So there was a physiologist called Paul Baker who started a project in Peru in this Nunua region uh, in the 60s and it was a kind of combined physiological and sociological project to see if they could uh, live with this population and just observe socially how they're adapting to the, uh, the low oxygen environment but also physiologically. And what Baker and his colleagues noticed uh, was that there was accelerated growth of the chest of these uh, Nunua people. In other words, they had large barrel-shaped chest compared to low-altitude people from, from neighboring regions. And that's just shown on this graph here. The thick line are the high-altitude adapted people, whereas the broken line, so the dots are low-altitude Peruvians, and the dashed line are, say, Americans or low-altitude residents like you or me. So he noticed that they had larger chests, they had larger lung capacities, so they could pull in more oxygen, but they had a lower stature, they tended to be smaller. So when you think about it from a, um, a uh, physiological standpoint, this made sense. They could take in more oxygen, but they had smaller bodies effectively to deliver that oxygen around. So they could take in more, but hopefully they had less of a demand. Uh, and this study kind of was the first to set off a series of studies that looked at particular traits across high altitude populations. Just to ask the question of whether these populations had adapted in the same way or different ways to the problem of low oxygen. And I'm going to show you some slides now from uh, excellent scientists such as Cynthia Bale and Lorna Moore who've, who've done a lifetime of incredible work showing these uh, patterns or different patterns that exist across the high altitude populations. So what they did is they'd measure a trait like say hemoglobin concentration. Remember I said the cyclists like to go to altitude to train because the hematocrit goes up. Uh, however, if they stay at altitude over many, many years, they're prone to chronic mountain sickness that can cause heart failure. Right? So you can imagine nat natural selection is probably going to reduce the incidence of chronic mountain sickness by trying to keep a hemoglobin level relatively controlled. So hemoglobin, important because it transports oxygen, but you don't want too much of it, otherwise you're going to be prone to hypertension and chronic mountain sickness. Uh, so this graph here shows you the hemoglobin <coughs> levels along the y-axis, and then values for males and females comparing Tibetans to Andeans. And just in blue here, I've got the average level that we might have uh, for males in the, in the population, is about 15 grams per deciliter, and females uh, naturally have a lower level. If you look at Tibetans, their values are very comparable to what we would have here. So even though they're living at three, four, five thousand 5,000 meters, where you'd expect them to have bumped up hermatocrits because of the low oxygen, their levels manage, they somehow managed to stay similar to what we would have dwelling at low altitude. The Andeans, on the other hand, if you go and monitor their levels when they're living at altitude, they're actually bumped well above the sea level norm. Right? So these are having uh, perhaps a classic response to a low oxygen environment by increasing their hemoglobin count. But they're increasing it to a dangerously high level. So these two lines are the accepted thresholds for chronic mountain sickness. Remember, too much hemoglobin, you start to develop chronic mountain sickness. So the higher line is the level for males, and you can see there's a chunk of the Andean population that just from this survey alone would have chronic mountain sickness. And for females, here's the lower line, and again, there's a number of, of Andeans from this survey which would have chronic mountain sickness. Whereas the percentage of Tibetans, in fact, is none of the males are falling above that line. And the Amhara of Ethiopia have levels that are a little bit higher, but quite similar to Tibetans. So the point is, these populations, although they're all human, right, they've had quite different responses to the same selective force of altitude. So another parameter that they looked at was nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is a naturally synthesized molecule that acts as a vasodilator. So a vasodilator means it tells your veins and arteries to relax. So when they relax, uh, it creates more space for our blood to flow through and that reduces our blood pressure. Right, so if you've got very high blood pressure, they try and usually drugs try and target uh, the pulmonary system <coughs> to try and relax your veins and arteries to try and reduce the blood pressure. So nitric oxide is a naturally occurring vasodilator and it reduces pulmonary retention and by doing so it increases blood flow so it means that oxygen can be carried from the lungs to more distant parts of the body. So you'd expect higher levels of nitric oxide might be beneficial in high altitude regions. So if you look at, say, us 
in this theater, we would have values that would be around 10 parts per billion, right? so relatively low. If you look in Bolivian Amara, Amara populations, you see the values are increased uh, by about a factor of two. But if you look in Tibetans, they're almost a, an order of magnitude higher. So again, you're getting quite dramatic differences in this same kind of response trait of, of nitric oxide. So differences at hemoglobin level, differences in the level of, nitric, of uh, nitric oxide. You could also measure the level of arterial oxygen saturation. So this is basically measuring uh, how saturated our blood is with oxygen. So if you measured it for any of us here now, we're sitting, breathing calmly, we probably have oxygen saturations of 98% or above. Uh, if we suddenly jump to the top of Everest, our oxygen saturations would be probably down around 60%. And incidentally, if you ended up, somehow ended up in intensive care, often the oxygen saturations of patients in intensive care drop very, very low. And some patients are able to cope with that and others can't, right? So that's one of the reasons, just as an aside, why people study these high altitude populations because they do, in a way, mirror the situation that patients in intensive care can be in uh, at low altitude where they become very hypoxic. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at oxygen saturations in the Tibetans living at altitude, they are quite low. They're around 90, 85 to 90%. So they're chronically hypoxic, whereas Andeans manage to maintain higher levels. And the Ethiopians have values comparable to Andeans. And even if you measure the breathing rates, right, so the resting ventilation rates, Tibetans have much higher levels than Andeans. Point of all this is that no matter what trait you look at, you tend to see quite distinct and different profiles across these different high altitude populations. So they're all coming up with their own solutions to the same problem. The final one I thought we'd look at is birth weight. So we all know that uh, a higher birth weight is generally speaking thought to be a good thing uh, with children. So you can ask the question, are the births due to mothers of Tibetan ancestry who gestated at altitude higher than those of people who moved to altitude and gestate there. So the Han or the Han Chinese, they obviously border uh, Tibet. And there was a study done by Lorna Moore and colleagues who looked at birth weights of Tibetan mothers compared to Han mothers who gestate at altitude. And I think the graph speaks for itself. You can see Tibetan mothers, there's a slight drop off as you go to high altitudes in birth weight, but in Han mothers, there's a much steeper drop off. So this is showing that Tibetan uh, women are better adapted to gestating at altitude and they're able to maintain higher birth weights in the children uh, who are born at altitude. And the same pattern is seen in South America. So this diagram here just kind of sums up uh, for those different traits that we've discussed, how the different populations have adapted in different ways. And indeed, if you measure uh, chronic mountain sickness as an outcome of a good adaptation, you see the Tibetans do very well because chronic mountain sickness is very, very low, as do the Ethiopians, but Andeans so far really haven't adapted well when you consider chronic mountain sickness as an outcome. So those studies uh, have been done over the last 20 or 30 years and they've shown at a physiological level that natural selection uh, is driving changes in indigenous populations to make them adapt to low oxygen. But those changes are different. Now remember, natural selection works on our DNA. So what is our DNA? DNA is a chemical that exists in the vast majority of cells in our body. Uh, it's a chemical that's really a code. It's a genetic code. There are three, it's three billion letters long and it made, it's made up of four different level, letters, A, C, G, and T. And contained within our DNA is the code for our genes, which code for proteins. Uh, so in a way, you can think of DNA as the book of life, and as David Attenborough once very eloquently said, we each have our own edition. And we each have our own edition uh, because with each generation, uh, we don't just pass on our DNA to our children, but we also pass on some new mutations that we didn't, ex ex we didn't have ourselves, but our children <laughs> inherit from us because the mutation occurred in our sperm and in our eggs. Right? And these mutations are critical because these are the differences that are introduced into a population on which natural selection acts, right? So we tend to think of mutations as bad things. We hear the word and we think, oh my God, that's gonna cause a disease. And sometimes it does cause disease and those things tend to be removed from the population by natural selection. But sometimes a mutation can be beneficial uh, 
uh, in which case it's pulled to a higher frequency in a population. So you can imagine if some mutation occurs in the Tibetan population and it allows them to uh, be more resistant to chronic mountain sickness, that's going to be a good thing and it's going to be selected to a high frequency in the population. Okay, so DNA is the level at which natural selection is occurring. And we want to understand the differences that occur between us uh, at the level of our DNA to try and find out the points at which natural selection is occurring. Now, our ability to do this has increased rapidly over the last couple of years because the cost of sequencing human genomes has dropped dramatically. So you might recall the sequencing of the first human genome. It happened about 10 years ago in 2002, 2003. It was big in the news, Clinton and Blair and so on were all making public statements about it. It was a massive international effort that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of years to complete. This is showing you the cost of sequencing a human genome and you can see it falls off a cliff somewhere around 2007 and that's because we've developed new technology that allows us to sequence to the point where today we can sequence all of your DNA for about $2,000 in about a week. Right? So it's very, very quick and relatively easy now to sequence a human genome. And this is uh, Moore's law of um, increasing computational speed with time. So you know, the way hard drives are getting bigger and bigger at the same price. This is that rate. And you can see the rate of sequencing cost has dropped even faster. So with this technology now, we can start to look at the DNA of people from these different populations to see if we can see the points of their genome that are under selection. So we conducted such a study a couple of years ago now so this should say detecting regions under natural selection, the Yunnan study. Uh, myself and some colleagues traveled to the Yunnan region of China a number of years ago to see if we could recruit ethnic Tibetans into our study to, to, to look at their DNA. The reason we went to Yunnan is that politically it was easier than entering Tibet because obviously there's a lot of controls now over entering Tibet, especially for um, non-tourist purposes. But Tibetans, of course, don't stay within the border. There's many thousands of Tibetans that live in uh, bordering regions with the actual uh, region of Tibet itself. So we flew into Kunming, took another flight to, to Zongdiang, and then we started sampling in this village uh, and then drove up a couple of valleys to Deqing and sampled from another, a number of other uh, villages in that region. At, in total, we recruited about 500 individuals from four different villages who are resident between three and 4,000 meters. So, I think Mount, uh, Mont Blanc is something just over 4,000 meters, so you, it gives you some idea of the altitude that these people are dwelling at, and they probably had something like 60% of the oxygen uh, available that we breathe here today. So we conducted some basic health tests on these people. It was kind of like an ex for an exchange for them giving us a saliva sample from which we could extract DNA. Uh, we did some basic health tests to try and uh, you know, give something back to the population where we could perhaps identify people who had potential health issues and so on. Uh, I just put in this picture, this is one of the regions that we recruited from, and there's this Mount Karagarbo, uh, which is an extra extremely important uh, religious site for uh, people of the Buddhist faith, and this is the mountain here. It's 6,740 meters, but it's never been climbed, which is something that really struck me when I was out there. You think that just because uh, Mount Everest has been climbed, that all the high mountains have been climbed. But there are many mountains in the Himalaya uh, that are either too remote or just too dangerous to climb. It doesn't necessarily have to be eight or 9,000 meters high to be extremely dangerous. Uh, mountains of, of this kind of altitude, uh, if they um, have extreme features on them, uh, may not have yet been climbed. So just very briefly with the science, we then ran our genetic analysis, looked at variants across the whole genome, and we very simply compared the Tibetan DNA to Chinese DNA, because the Chinese are thought to be the population from which Tibetans descend. Because remember, remember Tibetans are to the north of the Himalaya, so they would have been populated from the north, which is largely Chinese populations. When we compared those two uh, different sets of DNA, the region that popped up to be the strongest or more, most differentiated was this gene called EPAS1, right? So this is one gene of about 30,000 in our DNA. And you can ask them, well, what does EPAS1 do? Well, EPAS1 controls a gene called EPO, right? And we've heard the term EPO, or some of you may have heard the term EPO before, because it's uh, the chemical that some athletes like to take to boost their hemoglobin concentration. 
right? So EPO, erythropoietin, actually occurs naturally in our bodies. Our bodies start to produce it if it becomes hypoxic. So if we're unable to carry enough oxygen, we turn on EPO, and EPO tells our body to produce more hemoglobin. So that's why the cyclists like to take it, right? Because if you take an injection of EPO, your body immediately produces hemoglobin. This gene is the gene that controls hemoglobin being turned on and off through EPO. So when we found this, the first thing we asked is, well, does it correlate with hemoglobin concentration in the Tibetan population? And indeed it did. The type that was very, very frequent in the Tibetans correlated with low hemoglobin concentration. Right? And first of all, we thought this is a bit odd. I would have expected higher hemoglobin to be beneficial. But when you think about it, because of chronic mountain sickness, you want to have low hemoglobin concentrations if you're going to live at altitude uh, for your lifetime. So the type that was under natural selection in the Himalaya correlated with low hemoglobin. So this, in part, would explain why chronic mountain sickness is at a very low uh, frequency in the Tibetan population. So this same uh, observation was published by several other groups ar around the same time as us. Um, uh, very briefly, this is just showing uh, what EPAS1 does. It regulates a number of genes, including EPO. And if you're hypoxic, so if you hold your breath, let's say, and your oxygen levels drop in your body, uh, well then, EPAS1 can enter, find the DNA, and turn on certain genes. Whereas if you're normoxic, like all we are at the moment, where there's normal oxygen levels in our body, EPAS1 is, is broken down, so it's unable to turn on EPO and hemoglobin. So just changing the, the tack a little bit, I thought I'd go back to the question of Sherpa history. So remember I said that you find them today in Nepal in the Khumbu Valley, but their oral tradition said that they came from Tibet. Right? Well, that had never actually been proven uh, that they came from Tibet because you were relying on, on relatively limited um, uh, uh, records. With genetic testing now, it's very possible to determine the ancestry of an individual. And I think I'll just start by showing this graph here which is showing a number of individuals, probably a thousand odd individuals of European descent, who've all had their DNA studied, and then were able to run calculations that plot people according to their ancestry as determined by the DNA. So all these dots represent people, and the color represents the region from which they were recruited, so this kind of bluey purpley color is from Spain, and where they're positioned on the map represents uh, their genetic ancestry relative to other people uh, in the analysis. So what you see when you do this is that genes tend to mirror geography. So by that I mean that the Spanish and the Portuguese look very, very similar. Their closest relatives look like the French, who are very related genetically, it looks like, to the Swiss and the Belgians and the Germans and the Dutch. And if you come across the sea here, you get to, to Britain and you have the Scots and the Irish and so on. Right? And when you go south, you can see all the Italians. Uh, and out here in the middle of the Mediterranean, you've got a couple of Italians, and they turn out to be of Sardinian descent. Right, so genetics now actually has remarkable power to resolve the ancestry of individuals. And where you see divisions between groups means that there must have been some strong physical barrier that, that kept populations separate. And that's why they were able to evolve uh, or develop their own ge distinct genetic characteristics. If we ask this question in terms of the Sherpa, and we look at them in relation to Tibetans and Chinese, we see that Sherpa look very similar uh, to uh, their neighboring Tibetan population, which makes sense because we said that orally, at least, they are thought to have descended from Tibetans, and they look very different to Pakistani. So Pakistani would be a southern uh, Himalayan, uh, perhaps, founder G pool. So if they were of ne uh, Nepalese descent, you'd expect them to look perhaps a little bit more like the, the Pakistani uh, individuals at a genetic level. Uh, there was a paper that just came out last week uh, who did a very nice analysis. Uh, this is a, an admixture analysis, which is a new technique that allows you to assign ancestry within a genome. So this graph is showing you an ancestry analysis for hundreds of different individuals that have been recruited from different regions. And what the analysis does is it takes an individual and it tries to assign ancestry to different parts of the genome. So say if you had uh, a mother from Ireland and a father from Turkey, uh, then you'd expect that individual to have half Irish descent and half Turkish. So there'd be two different colors on this plot. When you do this for a number of Himalayan, East Asian, Siberian, and West Asian populations, 
you see uh, that the Sherpas stand out alone. They all have this big red block, which you might think of the original Himalayan genetic type. The Tibetans, on the other hand, look like they're about two-thirds uh, of that original Himalayan type and one-third of East Asian or Han. And that's because there's been gene flow into Tibet over the last couple of hundred years, which is effectively diluting that original uh, Himalayan, let's call it, genome. Uh, so for that reason, this analysis would seem to suggest that to, the Tibetans are actually an admixture or a, a mixture of East Asian and that original Himalayan uh, genotype. And the Sherpa seem to be preserved of, of that original uh, Himalayan type. Now, just very briefly before the finish, there are two other examples of natural selection that are ongoing in the human population. The first one is a really nice example of what we call balancing selection. Uh, and this is with sickle cell uh, anemia and malaria. So sickle cell anemia is a blood disease uh, where our blood cells lice and they're unable to carry oxygen. And for that region, reason, the sufferers are hypoxic and anemic. Uh, and this is showing you uh, the distribution of the genetic type for sickle cell anemia. So to have sickle cell anemia, it's like cystic fibrosis. You need to have two of the disease genes to have the condition. We call that homozygous state. Um, but if you're heterozygote, uh, for the sickle cell gene, you're resistant to malaria because your blood is that little bit thicker that the malaria parasite can't spread and divide in your blood, right? So if you're heterozygote, you're resistant to malaria. If you're homozygote, you're going to have sickle cell anemia. Normally with a variant like this that's, that causes a disease, it's kept at a very low frequency in the population because it's bad. But because the heterozygote, if you have one of the type, makes you resistant to malaria, natural selection has kept that variant at a high frequency. And that's why the highest frequencies for the sickle cell gene are find, found in those regions where malaria is most prevalent today. And another example that's a little bit closer to home is that of lactose intolerance. So <coughs> lactose is found in milk. Uh, we convert it to glucose and galactose through an enzyme called lactase. Uh, and normally, uh, we only produce lactase when we're, uh, when we're uh, being weaned. Right? So normally in human populations, after an individual stops breastfeeding, lactase is no longer produced. So they become lactose intolerant and they can't, they can't digest milk properly. And there's probably some individuals here who don't like drinking milk for that reason. Um, but the history of, of European populations is that farming developed around 10,000 years ago. And around the same time, there was a mutation that allowed lactase to always be expressed through life. So that variant was very beneficial because those people could drink milk. And today, the highest frequency for those variants are found in Northwest European populations. And in fact, if you run a selection scan in an Irish population, the point that shines out the highest is the gene for lactase. And that would reflect our dairy producing um, history. So just to conclude, really, the DNA that we carry today uh, really reflects the evolution that's occurred through many, many generations that reflects the history of our population. And that journey that our DNA has been, uh, been carried on today is reflected in the health or the uh, phenotypic expression of the population that we see. So we all carry DNA, but it isn't just magic inside us. It's a molecule that's been passed down generation after generation. The book has been passed down, and I think we're all privileged to carry that book for the brief time that we're on the planet today. And if we have children, we pass it on to the next generation. And through that, it goes through cycles of selection, right? So where in theory, we become more and more adapted to the environment that we live in. And even though we still experience many, many different diseases and we might complain about how it's hot or cold or whatever, our DNA has evolved to the point where I think today we've got a, uh, a remarkable population in the human population. So with that, I'd just like to uh, thank a number of people who contributed to the analysis that are presented here. And, and one name that I should have here is Mark McCormick, who did, or who helped with a lot of the analysis uh, on the, the Sherpa population. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I think the main take-home message is that the environment in which a, a population dwells in over time has a major impact on the genetic makeup of that, of that population, because the different selective forces at play over generations starts to shape the DNA of that people and that can have a following impact then on the health of that population or what diseases they're protected against or perhaps more vulnerable to. So we're just going to look at this issue with the example of the 
Tibetan populations who are dwelling at very, very high altitude where there's low oxygen and looking at the impact that that environment's had on their, on their genomes over time. And the whole Miniman series is just amazing. Like I'm in the latter stages of life and it deals with a lot of things that I, I'm really excited to find out about even now at this stage. I can't believe that this, this level of information is free. I'd recommend it to people of all age groups if they can come in. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, I find it very easy to understand them. They're in areas which I don't have a vast amount of expertise, but I found the whole thing very easy to understand and interesting. And I, I, I felt I actually learned kind of a lot out of it, coming in from it with not working in the area or, or having any actually kind of specialised knowledge of them. <laughs>